Thank you very much. Uh, I would uh, first I would like, of course, to, to thank uh, the Levy Institute for the invitation, and uh, I would ask Dimitri to keep me uh, like within 20 minutes, as I suppose that's what we have as our allotment, because I really don't want to go uh, too much, and there is no clock here. So uh, I suppose I will speak about income inequality. I've been working for a long time on income inequality, and in particular on global inequality. And just one word when you kind of wonder like what global inequality is. Global inequality is actually inequality between citizens of the world. In other words, when you speak of global inequality, we assume that the world is like one country essentially. And then we take all individuals based on household surveys and calculate inequality among them. And of course it involves lots of detailed uh, empirical and data work. Not the least is conversion of incomes expressed in national currencies into the uh, something which is called PPP, purchasing power parity dollars. So let's now look a little bit at how national and global inequalities changed in the age of globalization, because this is, as you can see, my topic, or how they changed between the fall of the Berlin Wall and the fall, what I call the fall of Wall Street. Uh, so let me, uh, I will go through some of the things which are quite known to the ma most people here, but it's sometimes useful to remind you that most national inequalities increase. I use here the Gini coefficient, which is a number which, if it goes up, that means inequality is increasing. And uh, that Gini coefficient normally ranges between 20, 25, which are very egalitarian countries, to something like 60, like South Africa, and the US is around 45, let's say. Um, and so you can see uh, here that if, if you just look at the column which says change, Generally speaking, we have had more countries with increasing inequality than countries with decline. And in particular, we have really, this is the same thing except that it is now on a graph with the Gini coefficient in 1988 and then the Gini in 2008. And as you can see, there are more countries above the line than below the line. So if you're above the line, that means your inequality went up. But what is also important is that it is really large countries because the dots here represent population size. It is really the large countries which generally had large increases in inequality. And these dots are China, or rural and urban, because China is divided. I will not go into why, because of household survey data, actually, and it sort of gives you better uh, handle on Chinese inequality. If you use uh, rural areas and urban areas, the same thing is true for India, rural and urban. So you can see this, like Russia, uh, urban China, rural China, US, Nigeria, these are all big dots which are above the 45 degree line. And then there is like two very interesting outliers to some extent, Brazil and Mexico. That's a really topic on which I will not have time to speak, but these are really countries which ver with very high inequality, but where we have had the declines in inequality in the last 10 years. So that's something very unique. It's practically not present in any other country. Uh, this is a graph which many of you have seen. It was actually, I mean, a version of that was made very popular by, by Piketty and Sayed's work about income inequality in the United States. Now, this is based on household surveys. This is not fiscal data, but this shows you the increase in real incomes at different percentiles of the income distribution in the U.S. between 1986 and 2010. And, of course, as that number is above zero, that means that you have had a real increase. And as that number becomes higher and higher, that means you have had a greater percentage increase. And not surprisingly, of course, you find that the largest increases were at the very top. So this is something that I would like you to get sort of for this next 15 minutes that I have adjusted. So assume essentially that almost all the countries in the world had a shape of income inequality change, which is very similar to the US shape, which means it is increasing with the level of percentile. So the poorest people had least increase or a decline, and as you go towards the, the richer percentiles, the increases were larger. Now, one caveat, that does not mean necessarily that the people, individuals at the top benefited more, because we don't really know who was there. We simply know that the top 1% gained, in this case, whatever, 80% in real terms. But we don't know because this is not longitudinal data. We just know that the top is much richer now than it used to be. But we don't know if these are the same people, because they could have been people from different percentiles that have moved up. So just that caveat, which would actually carry on through the rest. So this is kind of a cool graph, which I like, which uh, puts this increase in inequality 
in the perspective of levels of income. As you can see, US obviously is a much richer country than the others, and it sh shows that increase that I already mentioned. Then China, obviously, a very significant increase, and something that we would, to some extent, expe uh, expect from a country that is going through uh, essentially manufacturing transition, manu man uh, kind of a first industrial revolution, and uh, the increasing importance of manufacturing. Then, of course, similar story with Russia. But now, uh, let me just list some of the issues that are raised by the growing national inequalities before I move to the, my next section, which is about global inequality, is that one is, of course, the issue of whether it might have had something to do with the financial crisis. I always like to mention that because it seems nobody has read it, but in March 2009, I wrote what seemed to me very sort of straightforward story why inequality might have had something to do with the financial crisis. Now, the story, I never sort of followed that through. It was a, an op-ed piece on, on Yale Global Online. But then, of course, it's essentially similar, actually. Practically the same story was then, independently, I'm sure, done by Rajan and more recently by, by Stiglitz. But because I worked on inequality, it seemed to me like a no-brainer that it had something to do. But it has now become a mainstream view, more or less. Uh, then there is another issue that real inequality might be actually greater than whatever I show you here because we tend in household surveys to under uh, sort of uh, under measure or actually miss out very rich people. Rich people either don't participate in surveys or they underestimate their incomes. So in other words, the reality may be more, there is greater inequality than in whatever I'll show you here with numbers. And then the last point, which actually people started asking me when the, when the Arab uh, Spring happened, is really was it related to, to inequality? And when you look at measured inequality in these countries, it really had not changed in the last quarter of a century. But it could be that the perception has changed. And of course, we have some indirect evidence from Gallup world polls that show some increased perception in those countries, which may be related to, as I mentioned there, to chronic capitalism and what was called, Max Weber called it, I think nicer term, political capitalism than chronic capitalism. And so there could be an issue of perception. So basically, we underestimate inequality in our numbers because we miss the top guys. And we, of course, cannot adjust for the perception because it's obviously a different uh, dimension. So now let me move to, ah, this is actually my new graph, which I have, not, have shown very few times. This is really something new. Uh, uh, data from Luxembourg income study, harmonized data, the effect of, of the crisis, essentially. The change in income between 2007 and 2010. And these are four countries that you can see, Italy, Spain, Greece, US. The red line is zero real change. You see, practically everybody is below the, the zero line, so the real change was negative across the entire distribution. But what you notice there is that shape. And that shape stays with us whatever we do, and that shape, of course, is pro-rich again, because the losses were greater for the poor. Now, as you can see, not, I mean, there are differences between the countries, but it's very remarkable that on these four cases, we have practically the same shape. UK has a very similar shape, but then the only other country that I have, for example, Colombia, which was not affected by the crisis, has an entirely different shape. So there was clearly something with the crisis which led to worsening of income inequality, and we know that for the US, even from the you know, household survey and fiscal data, and we know that's also something which is very different from the crisis 1929-33, which actually led to a decline in income inequality. So let me move to the pattern of global inequality between 88 and 2008. It's based on some new and um, harmonized or made consistent databases and I will skip some of this, I'll have to skip some graphs for the sake of the, uh, you know, speed, sorry. But I just want you to focus on these la dots, which are then, then uh, called concept three inequality. This is this global inequality that I started my talk with. And I said it's inequality between world citizens. And as you can see, that inequality has been generally stable and on the decline from around year 2000. So if you focus just on this, green dots. You see that they're actually the last two dots are lower than the previous dot. So for three dots already from 2002, we have this decline. Now, the decline in global, you have, these are two, two difficult things. On one hand, you have practically all countries, particularly big countries, with increase in within national inequalities. 
On the other hand, you have global inequality, which is much higher than national inequalities, which was stable and now on the decline. So these two things have to be reconciled. And of course, the way that it's reconciled and why it has happened is because we had, as I tell my students, we have two big sumo wrestlers for fighting global inequality. And these two sumo wrestlers are called China and India. And they're sumo wrestlers who stop increasing global inequality and reduce it because of a very high rate of growth of these countries, which are, of course, poor. And as they become richer and move through the income distribution, despite the fact that within themselves there is widening gap between their own people, they are actually moving up the income ladder lots of people from their countries. And this is some epochal change, which I will not have time to explain today, but it's probably the first time since the Industrial Revolution that we do have a decline of glo in global inequality. Because it's just from the Industrial Revolution until now, practically, it went up or was plateauing in the previous 30 years. So in that sense, it's very uh, hopeful and very new development, which takes place uh, sort of against the background of widening national development. And that raises, of course, the issue, I'm jumping ahead of myself, but that raises the issue that I will not have the time, but I will just put that as a question. Uh, if you do have sort of a decline in national middle classes, how is it could be reconciled and what would be the political arrangements that would emerge while at the same time you might have something which is global middle class? So I'll just leave this as a question that may be something that we will discuss later. Now, what are the facts? There are three facts that I want uh, to, to sort of single out about global inequality. First, that there were very large gains globally made by the people around the median, around the median of the global income distribution. And you will see that in a, in a graph in a moment. And the gains were the, and in the top, global 1%. But the gains were the least among the poor people and among something which you might call up, global upper middle class, which is around 70th or 80th percentile of the global income distribution, where exactly you would find uh, uh, poor people from rich countries and middle classes of Latin America and Eastern Europe. Broadly, these are the people who lost. Now, the people who gain, and this is this key graph, are people here. This is essentially, I call it, quote, unquote, China's middle class. It's actually much more complex than that. You have there people from India, Indonesia. You have many people there. But just to fix our sort of thoughts or minds, we can see this graph as the uh, essentially a summary of the winners and losers of the last 20 years. Now, the, what the graph shows, maybe I should have said it before, is that on the horizontal axis, you, percent, you have percentiles of global income distribution. So it's the same idea as what I showed you with respect to the United States, except now that on the, on the x-axis, on the horizontal axis, you have percentiles of global income distribution. And as you look towards the middle, you see this large increase because on the vertical axis you have real gains. So you see that guys who were actually around the 50th percentile, 40th to 60th approximately, they actually had very significant real gains. And that's where, quote unquote, you can find Chinese uh, rural, and uh, actually rural because it's relatively low level of income, middle class. And then you actually, look at that really remarkable decline in real incomes around the 80th percentile of the world income distribution. And that's where you actually find many people from, as I said, Latin America, Eastern Europe, and poor, relatively poor people from the rich countries. And again, to give you ideas, this is actually, this is very, very low levels of income. We are talking about people who are below $4, uh, uh, I mean, uh, $4 per capita per day. So this is really way below for example, this is the U.S. poverty line. Uh, it comes to around 80th percentile of the world income distribution. So actually, for the U.S. population, everybody, with few exceptions, maybe two or three percentiles would be below, but everybody would be above the 80th percentile. And for the rich countries, there will be nobody who is going to be below that level. So that's where, of course, the losses, not losses, but relatively low gains were made. And also that's where, actually, the top global percentile made large gains. And just for the, as, uh, as I want to mention, one half of the global top percentile is composed of American citizens. Or differently, differently put, 12% of the richest Americans are members of the global top one percentile. Because obviously it's harder to be top US, uh, top 1% in the US income distribution, you require more money than to be top 
uh, one percent of the global income distribution. So that what the, now the uh, I'll skip this is basically the same shape at every five year interval. So the shape has remained the same. But let me move to the fact number two. So this was a very uh, positive, let's say, or optimistic view of looking at it because as you can see, you have seen, actually the relative gains were very, very strong around the median. But when we translate these relative gains into absolute gains, then the picture is a little bit different because the gaps between different levels of uh, distribution are so huge that even if you're really uh, of, at the top and making very little in relative gains, this is very substantial amount in absolute terms. And that's when you translate it in absolute terms that you can actually find that more than one half, these are now absolute gains. It's the same graph that I showed you before, but now translated from relatives into the absolute. So then you take the entire increase in GDP, or actually of uh, in, in increase in incomes, according to household surveys, between 1988 and 2008, and say, well, who gained that? So there is like this increase of 100, let's suppose. Who gained it? And actually what you need see there, the top 5% gained more than one half of the total increase in income. Now, uh, the, the, those who actually benefit in real terms, when you translate these, real, these relative gains, are now relatively small. They are quite small. They are actually 3%, 4% of the total increased pie that was received by the people who were in the median. So in other words, what I want to, without complicating this further, I want to say in relative terms, the major beneficiaries were people around the median of the global income distribution and the top 1%. When you translate that in absolute gains, the picture changes because really the, the most of the gains, more than one half, was really realized by the top 5%. Again, with the caveat that these may not be the same people so we really, we just know that the top 5% is much richer today than 20 years ago. We don't know if these are the same people. And uh, fact number three, oh, which I already mentioned, is that the pattern of global inequality change differed from the pattern of national inequality change. So this is already, that's what I mentioned, but I just would like to remind you. This is this pattern that I would like you to remember. This is what I call this reclined or supine S. It's a very unusual pattern to find in what is called growth incidence curves. And the pattern which actually is sort of national pattern exemplified by the United States in this case is this upward slope. So this is really the two patterns that emerge from this and that we have to keep, of course, distinct. And the upward pattern for the US is not unusual. And here I pulled out some examples. You see, you can read the countries, Philippines and the Bangladesh, Mexico, Colombia, and then very striking here, urban and rural China, for example, and urban and rural Indonesia. You actually still have exactly the same pattern, increasing inequality, the gains are larger, the higher you go in the income distribution, the more uh, the is increase in your income. And notice one further thing, which is not very clear here because I didn't label it, but blue colored are rural data and, and, and red is urban. So as you can see at every percentile of the distribution, the urban people got more than rural people, which meant that basically the gap, particularly in China, which is already uh, very high, the gap between rural and urban incomes, or rather urban and rural incomes, increased further. And it's now four to one, and it's one of the main reasons that drives China inequality up. So uh, I suppose, how many minutes, do, have I already gone beyond my time, or? I have five, okay. So if I have five, then I can slowly try to, to uh, uh, wrap it up. Basically, uh, what we need to kind of adjust, like with these two balls, is to realize that it was really the different uh, pattern of growth of countries and where they were in income distribution that led this, to this reclining S shape of gains, or actually gains or losses, over the last 20 years. And that's a remarkable shape because it has political, I think actually, it has significant political uh, implications. The first one, which I think I'm sure that everybody had that when I, when he saw this, when he or she saw this graph, is, is there some relationship between the growth, I put it in very kind of crude terms, between the growth of middle class in China or emerging market economies, and likewise absence 
of growth in incomes in middle classes in rich world. In other words, is the hump around the median related to the slow growth in the 90th percentile? Mind you, from the point of view of global welfare, it's actually a positive development because you gain more by sort of having poorer people grow more than you lose by having relatively rich people uh, grow more slowly. So from the global perspective, this is obviously a very good development. But it's not necessarily a good development from the national perspective if you have to deal with the hollowing out of the middle class and absence of growth in median incomes and incomes of the poor. But that, I think, raises the fundamental issue, I think, for this whole maybe century, is how these two processes, if indeed this continues, and the crisis seems to indicate that it might, will be reconciled. How would you reconcile political decision-making at the national level, where you have to deal with the issues that we all know and that I mentioned, with, on the other hand, uh, rebalancing between East and West, and to some extent between the North and the South, and the emergence of, quote-unquote, the global middle class. So this marching of China and India through the ranks reduces global income inequality, as I said, for the first time probably in the last 200 years, and also importantly reduces this element of between country uh, gaps in global inequality. So, uh, but as it might cause, quote, unquote, unquote, increases in within national inequality. So that was, of course, it might cause, again, I put that under quotation marks, uh, increase in inequality, holding out of the middle class and increase in inequality in the rich countries. So this is actually, uh, we'll end with this, is that there we see, I went back to Mendeville and I said, can something that is bad nationally, which is increased inequality, be good globally? Because if you have these two phenomena, these two uh, movements at the same time, one of them you might consider this bad because it's national inequality rising. On the other one, they are maybe sort of leading to high growth rates in the countries and to decrease in inter internationally uh, uh, in incre uh, declining inequality globally. So in other words, can national vices produce global virtue, which I think is the essentially, uh, I'll skip that, it is essentially the key uh, question. Um, I've already mentioned this. This is the issue of what would, would, would global middle class mean. And then I really end with the total speculation is where I actually, I've sort of become maybe more, uh, uh, how should I say, uh, skeptical or pessimistic about the possibilities of uh, checking or stopping or, or uh, reversing the increase in inequality in the rich countries simply because I don't see a very clear mechanism that we, uh, in the way that it should be. And as you can see here, I call this a long periodo especial in uh, capitalist economies because they had to face the Great Depression, the war, and the communist uh, threat. And all of that led, I think, actually to some extent to a reduction in within national inequalities. Now, these threats are no there, are no longer anymore. And if you look at two different uh, I'll stop, I'll finish there. If you look at two different theories about what moves in income inequality nationally, you have Kuznets, but Kuznets can apply quite well to China, and we might see why Kuznets might apply to China and why China might start having a decline in inequality as it sort of changes and becomes more developed economy. But we really don't know how would Kuznets work or what would actually drive U.S. inequality to go down. And then the alternative, and I just recently reread Piketty's original work on France, is to say inequality decline in Western economies happened because of these things which I mentioned here, but be happened because really of political decisions. And these political decisions were high taxation on inheritance, high progressive taxation, and unfortunately war which destroyed lots of capital and changed the distribution between capital and labor. So clearly there is no political will or maybe it's impossible in the era of globalization to go with high taxation. So I really don't see it, that's why I've become sort of maybe pessimistic that we might actually have to get adjusted to the permanently higher inequality within rich countries. And of course the changes of course possibly in inequality in the emerging market economies. So I will stop here, I'm sorry that I went a little bit over. Thank you very much.
Um, so, ah, here we are. Okay, well, I'm, I'm afraid my talk is not going to be as uh, colorful as Bronco's. <laughs> my talk will be in black and white, uh, so I apologize. Uh, uh, any case, uh, I'm also going to shift focus uh, to uh, just the U.S. and um, also just concentrate mainly on what happened during the uh, what's now called the Great Recession. But uh, in doing so, I will uh, try to give you a little bit of a historical background. And the topic is uh, wealth inequality, household wealth. So. Gizmo here. You press this. Uh, right. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. Point it up there. Uh, well, so. Uh, oh, it did work. Okay. Maybe. Oh, you know what it is. Maybe I had it upside down. Okay, yeah, okay, uh, upside down, sorry. Uh, <laughs> so what happened during the Great Recession? Uh, well, I'm sure all are familiar with uh, what happened uh, in terms of uh, the ice asset price meltdown. Now, I use, I use uh, because of uh, uh, the data source I use is a survey of consumer finances, um, I'm using the period from 2007 to 2010. And uh, as you can see, uh, according to my calculate, well, not my calculations, according to official data, uh, housing prices fell by 24 percent, and stock stock prices were down by 26 percent. So that sort of sets the uh, the backdrop for what happened to household wealth. Um, okay, I'm not going to go through what is wealth, uh, the usual stuff. I'll just mention that. Uh, I don't include uh, vehicles, Federal Reserve Board does in its standard definition. And also in this, in this um, uh, presentation, I'm not including what's called Social Security wealth or uh, should be defined benefit uh, pension wealth. Okay. Uh, so this is just focuses on marketable wealth. And uh, the data source, as I mentioned, is the Survey of Consumer Finances. Um, and this is now a triennial survey. And this uh, survey has, has the uh, advantage of um, having what's called a high income supplement. So uh, it, uh, it's probably the best survey in the US, maybe the world, in terms of getting uh, reasonably good data on very wealthy people. So that's why it's used a lot when we look at uh, overall wealth inequality. So I'm actually going to skip this and just focus on these uh, little tables. I'm sorry. It's, I do have some colors here, but uh, I think this is easier to read. <laughs> uh, OK, so uh, <clears throat> first thing of interest is um, that wealth was, was growing uh, pretty robustly. Uh, these are percentage changes from 1983 to 2001. Uh, median wealth was up by 24 percent, and during the uh, period from 2001 to 2007, up by 19 percent. So this is, uh, you know, pretty substantial growth. Uh, mean w wealth uh, was, uh, of course, up at, uh, up even more, and that that's because wealth inequality was rising. But <clears throat> you know, what's striking if you contrast this with uh, income. And this uses the official uh, uh, current population survey uh, measure and definition of income. Uh, you can see that income is growing uh, much less uh, even during uh, this first period. And from 2001 to 2007, it was, it was basically stagnating. Uh, <clears throat> so at once, there was a pu puzzle of why median uh, wealth was growing uh, so well, particularly from uh, 2001 to 2007, while incomes were basically stagnating. Um, and then when we fast forward uh, to the Great Recession, I mean, 
you know, you have some stunning developments. Uh, median net worth is down by 47 percent. This is really uh, uh, absolutely amazing. Uh, in fact, the uh, 2010 figure is, is back where it was in about 1969. I mean, you know, we've been driven back to the dark ages. Median wealth, uh, I'm sorry, mean wealth uh, also fell, not, but not nearly as much. It was down by 18 percent. And, uh, you know, we saw that uh, incomes were basically stagnant uh, from early part of the uh, last decade, uh, 2007 to 2010. Uh, they fell. These are all in real terms, uh, uh, by about five or six percent. But again, not nearly as much as uh, as wealth. So uh, you know, we already have a puzzle of why uh, wealth was up so much more than incomes uh, up until 2007, and why they why it fell so much more um, between 2007 and 2010. 2010 is, is actually the last survey we have available. Um, another uh, puzzle is if you remember what happened to uh, asset prices, particularly housing prices. Because as we'll see, uh, the main asset of the middle class, the median, is uh, homes. But remember that uh, home prices were down, uh, let's see if I can remember, 24 percent. But uh, median net worth fell by. 47 percent, almost double the rate of change of uh, housing prices. So uh, that's also a bit of a puzzle, which we will try to resolve. Um, and uh, I'll just, I think I'll shift here to inequality. Uh, actually, I'll, I'll show you this first, because uh, just, just focus on the bottom line. This, this is, uh, looks at Gini coefficients, which uh, Bronco has mentioned before. Uh, you can see, you know, except for uh, an upward blip from 1983 to 89, uh, wealth inequality was basically flat until 2007. Um, is there a, uh, let's see. Uh, but suddenly it, it just uh, takes off from 2007 to 2010. It really spikes over the Great Recession. And uh, you know, parenthetically, this is this is very unusual for uh, wealth or even income inequality to uh, go up so much during a recession. So that's another uh, puzzling part of the story: why inequality uh, increased so much. Uh, in fact, uh, I'll show in, I'll show you this in a second. Uh, this this just says the same thing. You can see this huge increase of the Gini coefficient. Uh, from 2007 to 2010 by 0.036 uh, Gini points. That's, that's very big, very big. Uh, in contrast, if you look at incomes, um, you actually find a decline in income inequality over the Great Recession. Uh, again, focusing just on the Gini coefficient, goes down by 0.025. Uh, now, um, I should mention that these uh, computations are, are based on the survey of consumer finances, uh, which, which has um, this uh, high income supplement, and therefore we have much better data on the, uh, on the very wealthy. And also I should note that uh, the data are not top coded in the official census data, the current population survey. The, uh, the values are actually um, uh, top code. There's, there's a, uh, a top income class. Uh, used to be about 100,000. I'm not sure what it is today. Uh, so you don't really know what incomes are above 100,000. So this shows, uh, you know, uh, uh, actually a fairly dramatic decline. The current population survey data, on the other hand, shows, uh, uh, you know, almost, uh, almost no change. And, uh, and this Piketty and Saiz data source that uh, Bronco mentioned uh, actually also shows a fairly steep decline in uh, inequality pretty much over this period. Now that's based on um, tax data. And this tax data is uh, also uh, not top coded. 
and therefore has much better uh, representation of the very wealthy. So what's going on in terms of income is that uh, you know, the, the very rich took a big hit in terms of uh, dividends and interest and uh, capital gains. Uh, this, this definition of income includes capital gains. So they really got hit. You can see the share of the top 20 percent uh, going down. Uh, in contrast, uh, even though the middle class is hit by the recession, therefore higher unemployment, um, and uh, wages uh, went down over uh, these years uh, by three or four percent. In relative terms, uh, they didn't, they weren't hit as badly as the very wealthy. Uh, the bottom forty percent were also. Uh, Hit, uh, but they they were uh, at least uh, partially sustained by uh, rising transfer payments, particularly unemployment uh, benefits, uh, uh, food stamps, and the like. So though their share did go down, uh, it wasn't as um, dramatic uh, as it might have been. So income inequality uh, goes down, whereas wealth inequality goes up. Uh, by the way, this is the usual story for a recession. Uh, income inequality usually declines during a recession. Um, I can talk about this one. Now, a large part of the story is uh, in terms of, uh, of leverage. Um, you know, as I'll show in a second, the uh, middle class particularly went into a debt splurge during the period from about 1983 to uh, 2007, particularly during the uh, 90s and into the 2000s. Um, you know, you can see, uh, first of all, uh, I'll get to that in a second, but first of all, just comparing uh, <coughs> the portfolios, and I'll focus just on the middle class and the top 1%. Um, uh, you can see that <clears throat> For the uh, very wealthy, the top 1%, homes constituted only 9% of their total assets. But look at uh, the middle class, which I defined here as the middle three wealth quintiles. Uh, <clears throat> homes amounted to fully two-thirds of all their assets. <clears throat> Among the very rich, uh, most of their assets were in um, uh, stocks and bonds. That was 25 percent. That's mainly stocks. Uh, but look at this uh, other component, uh, business equity. This is unincorporated business e equity and investment in real estate. That made up uh, full, fully one half of their wealth. Um, so the portfolios were very different, and, um, and the rich uh, were much more concentrated in investment type assets, middle class, uh, largely in homes, also in liquid assets and, and pension assets. Um, but the other side of the story is if you look at the debt, I call it debt equity ratio, it's really the ratio of debt to net worth. Uh, you can see <coughs> a huge difference. The uh, wealthy uh, uh, had a ratio of only 3.5%. Uh, uh, so their debt is very small uh, compared to their uh, total wealth. In contrast, and uh, we'll see that even now this figure is a little low, uh, this debt to net worth ratio was 72 uh, percent for the middle class. <coughs> so the middle class was uh, much more heavily leveraged, uh, and this will play a large role in explaining what happened to their wealth, to median wealth, and also what happened to inequality. Uh, <clears throat> so the much higher leverage for the middle class. And actually, if you look at the debt to income ratio, that's even more dramatic, 60% uh, for the top 1% and 135% uh, uh, for the middle class. So the middle class much more heavily in debt. And in fact, uh, if you go back in time, uh, and this is sort of uh, what led up, uh, I think, uh, in, 
large part to the financial crisis. Uh, yes, it was rising inequality, but you know, the other side of the story was that uh, it was the uh, amazing growth of debt, particularly of the middle class. You can see the debt to net worth ratio going from 37 to 61 uh, percent, and debt to income ratio going from 67 to 157 percent. So uh, over this period, uh, the middle class was going through a, a debt splurge. Uh, and if I have time, uh, I'll argue that was, uh, to a large extent, uh, if not uh, permitted, not only permitted, but in fact encouraged uh, by the banking system, that the uh, financial institutions really uh, pushed this incredible debt onto the middle class. Uh, and this really set, set the... Uh, you know, set the uh, the premise for uh, the financial implosion that occurred uh, 2007 and 2008. Uh, you can see also, just looking at the bottom line, um, that uh, that again, the middle class was uh, was uh, eviscerating its uh, the equity in their homes. They were just using their homes uh, as a source of borrowing. So the mortgage debt to home value uh, went from 29 percent to 47 percent. So, um, you know, it was the rising debt, particularly of the middle class, that, uh, that really set the stage for the Great Recession. And you can already imagine what will happen when uh, housing prices uh, collapse. Uh, so, anyway, uh, I think I've talked about this, um, I don't have that much time. So, really, the key, the key part of the story is in terms of leverage, and in fact, the uh, differing leverage between the rich and the middle class. So, here's just, uh, I don't want to use up, do I have, uh, I still have a bit of time. So, here are just a couple of arithmetic examples. So, this is for the rich. So in this story, uh, they have 50 in assets and zero in debt. You know, the rich basically have no debt. Uh, so their net worth goes, uh, it was 50. And now suppose uh, asset prices increase by 20%. So what happens? Well, um, their net worth goes from 50 to 60. So their net worth also goes up by 20%. Now, let's look at the middle class. This is the uh, miracle of leveraging. Uh, so now the middle class, 50 in assets, 40 in debt, uh, net worth of 10. And again, assume asset prices go up by 20%. Well, what happens to their net worth? Well, their net worth goes from 10 to 20. It doubles. It doubles. So, uh, you know, this is why... Uh, uh, particularly businesses like to uh, get as much as uh, debt as they can so they can leverage their capital gain. Uh, so during uh, periods of rising asset prices, uh, leverage is good. It really uh, increases the rate of return on your net worth. In this case, you can see this has doubled uh, compared to a 20 percent increase uh, for the rich. But, of course, uh, what happens when asset prices go down? Uh, here is another example where I've stuck in other assets. So in this case, uh, assume stock prices go down by 20 percent, which is about what happened. Uh, and, uh, again, this is for the rich. So their net worth goes down by 10 percent, which is about what happened. And, uh, in contrast, look at what happened to the middle class. Uh, again, uh, their net worth started at, starts out at 40 in year one, and now again, uh, assuming housing prices go also go down by 20 percent, which is pretty much what happened. Um, so housing goes from 60 to 48, and their net worth goes from 40 to 28, or by 30 percent. So the story is, uh, you know, high leverage is great when asset prices are rising. But when asset prices go down, uh, you really get hammered. And, uh, 
in particular, uh, you get hammered a lot more than uh, the very wealthy who are not leveraged at all. So already you can see uh, the seeds of this rising wealth inequality. The higher leverage of the middle class leads to a much steeper percentage decline in net worth than, uh, than that of the rich who aren't leveraged at all. Uh, also, another thing to note is, uh, you know, the one puzzle was why you know, housing prices went down by 24 percent, but median net worth was down by 47 percent. And you can see again the role of leverage. Here, housing prices go down by 20. In this example, net worth goes down by 30. So the effect of an asset price decline is uh, magnified when a household uh, has a higher degree of leverage. I won't talk about this yet. So uh, getting back to the story, um, so now you know we can see the seeds of what happened. Normally, uh, wealth inequality rises with income inequality. And actually, another factor is that it uh, also rises with the ratio of stock prices to housing prices. So in periods when stock prices go up more than housing prices, because the middle class is, uh, the rich is, are much more heavily invested in uh, stocks, and uh, you know unincorporated businesses, their prices tend to move with stocks. So when stock prices go up, uh, the rich benefit uh, much more than the middle class. Uh, conversely, when housing prices go up, because as we saw, the middle class has a much heavier concentration of housing in their portfolio than the um, than the very rich, when housing prices go up, the wealth of middle class rises relative to that of the rich. So the key, key ingredient is the ratio of stock prices to uh, housing prices. And, uh, but we saw during the Great Recession, uh, that ratio was basically unchanged. Housing prices and stock prices went down about the same amount. And so, uh, and in income inequality went down, so uh, you would have expected that wealth inequality would, would also go down a bit, or at least remain unchanged. Uh, but the key ingredient is the much higher leverage of the middle class. And that's why their wealth went down much more than the wealth of the wealthy. Uh, median wealth was down by 47 percent, uh, the wealth of the top 1 percent was down by about uh, 15 percent. And that's really the source of this big spike in wealth inequality over the Great Recession. Uh, also, the fact that uh, the middle class was so much more leveraged, or was had a high degree of leverage, that was the reason why uh, median wealth declined much more than median income, because of the effect of this leverage. Uh, actually, the story is very similar when you look at uh, racial differences. Uh, just looking at mean net worth, you can see a big decline from 2007 to 2010 between blacks and whites from 19 to 14 percent. And uh, particularly uh, Hispanics really got hammered by the Great Recession. Uh, ratio went from 26 percent. Actually, you can see that just looking at the first column, this is the ratio of net worth between Hispanics and non-Hispanic whites. They were making incredible progress uh, catching up with, uh, with uh, whites up until 2007. Uh, and that was mainly because, if you look at the last column, uh, they had a huge increase in their home ownership rate. This was a story of uh, subprime mortgages. The uh, banking system <laughs> was feeding uh, Hispanics and uh, actually uh, African-American families with these uh, sub, subprime mortgages. 
Uh, so the good side was that the, particularly among Hispanics, big increase, this just shows their relative home ownership rate, uh, big increase in their home ownership rate uh, from 2001 to 2007. So that was the upside of this, uh, of this credit binge, this uh, uh, loosening uh, credit standards for, for loans, uh, preying on the PREY, preying on the uh, minorities, uh, shoving these uh, mortgage loans on them. So a big increase in their uh, home ownership rate. But then look what happens from 2007 and 2010. They just get hammered by the Great Recession. The ratio of mean wealth plummets from 26% to 15%. And actually, in absolute terms, um, uh, the mean wealth of, the, of Hispanics actually goes down by more than 50%. So they really get uh, uh, badly treated by the, uh, by the Great Recession. And what happened here? Is that the end? Oh, yeah, and, and you can see the reason uh, the Hispanics and African Americans had much higher concentration of their assets in homes, just looking at the first row. Uh, um, over half of the uh, Wealth of uh, minorities were invested in their homes compared to 31% for uh, whites. Uh, but even more notable is if you look at the debt to net worth ratio uh, over here, which had a pointer, but uh, uh, you can see they were much more heavily indebted than whites. Uh, their debt to net worth ratios were over 50% compared to only 15% for whites. So when the asset prices plunged, uh, you know, their net worth went down even, uh, went down much more than that of uh, white families. Uh, and a similar story, uh, if you look at it by age group, uh, actually let me show you this first because this is pretty amazing. Uh, yeah, if you just look at the uh, first row, so uh, younger families are much more heavily concentrated in, uh, in, home, in housing, their portfolio, uh, than older families. But look at these uh, debt to net worth ratios for families under 35, 93%. And for those 75 and over, just 2%. So again, you can see, uh, you can already see the effects of uh, this differential leverage on what happened to uh, um, relative net worth, and uh, you know, you can see. Uh, look at 2007 to 2010. The um, mean net worth of age group uh, under 35 goes from 17 percent to 10 percent of the overall average. That's a huge decline. Uh, 35 to 44. Uh, goes from 58% to 41%. So, you know, it was the groups that were uh, highly leveraged and who had a high concentration of their assets in their homes uh, that really got uh, smashed by, by the Great Recession. So, uh, anyway, the, these, which I won't review this, but uh, on the policy front, what does this mean? Well, I think, uh, uh, you know, what we have to do, uh, I've been arguing, is that we uh, really have to uh, regulate the mortgage market, the housing mortgage market. Uh, financial institutions, certainly uh, leading up to the Great Recession, were, uh, were not only uh, too uh, loose on their credit, uh, but they were actively pushing these loans, mortgage loans, on people who could obviously not afford them. You know, we could talk about no doc loans, uh, no down payments, uh, 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 subprimes. So, uh, you know, if you, if you leave the banking sector unregulated, I know uh, this is not, it's contrary to what our luncheon speaker was arguing. 
Uh, and uh, though they have tightened up credit over the last uh, five or six years, as soon as the new uh, next bubble, housing bubble, hits, I think we're going to go through exactly the same scenario again. And uh, so, you know, serious, I think uh, there has to be serious regulations imposed on uh, the financial sector uh, to prevent a repeat of this crisis. Uh, and, you know, this, this whole thing was abetted by securitization because, uh, you know, the other thing that made banks and other financial institutions willing to uh, issue these uh, non-credit worthy, worthy uh, mortgage loans uh, was that they could uh, package up the mortgages and sell them off almost immediately so they didn't hold any of the risk. Uh, so again, uh, you know, there has to be some serious uh, uh, regulation of uh, the process of securitization. Um, so anyway, uh, that's sort of uh, my policy implication. I'll just say one more thing. Uh, I actually gave this, uh, this talk yesterday at the New School, and uh, I guess those of you familiar with the New School, uh, so Ed Nell, who's a professor there, made this point that... Uh, Part of the reason why, um, why, the, why, why there was this credit splurge, uh, that there was really, it was really purposeful on the part of the uh, Federal Reserve Board, and, uh, and that this was, uh, this was the only way to stimulate the economy, particularly in the late 1990s when, um, um, when the federal government was running uh, budget surpluses. So, uh, you know, basically the expansionary policy uh, from about 19, even earlier, maybe from the mid-90s through 2007, was to uh, uh, loosen up credit so that, uh, you know, bam, so, uh, so in order to stimulate uh, household consumption. And this, what, uh, this is the uh, thing that kept the, uh, the economy booming uh, until about 2007. Um, so anyway, let me stop there. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm not Ajit Zacharias, but I do sometimes play him on stage. Um, okay. So uh, today I want to talk a bit about um, the uh, Levy Institute Measure of Economic Well-Being, or LIMU, which uh, our previous speaker, Ed Wolf, has been instrumental in developing. Um, so I'm going to talk a, uh, just a bit about uh, the measure itself, uh, and how it differs from household income, which is the usual uh, measure of economic well-being and inequality, uh, and uh, then talk about how uh, our measure has evolved over time, trends in inequality, and then compare uh, trends in the U.S. to uh, trends in, the, in Britain, France, and Canada in the 90s and 2000s. So all that in 20 minutes, no problem. Um, so. Um, just to begin with uh, what our concept of economic well-being is and with, uh, with you know, the use of household income as a measure of economic well-being, uh, we share that in common. And basically, um, we're trying to measure uh, the command of a household over economic output, right? so goods and services uh, that are produced. Um, so uh, household income uh, is a traditional measure for uh, trying to assess that command over goods and services, uh, but it has some uh, deficiencies um, which we try to correct. The Canberra report, which came out of a meeting looking at some of those deficiencies, you know, had some recommendations. Ours, our actual measure goes a little further than uh, their, um, their uh, recommendations, um, but we can trace our uh, kind of theoretical lineage to Adam Smith, who uh, drop that quote 
couple hundred years ago. So um, necessaries, conveniences, and amusements, or economic output, whatever you want to call it, right? Okay, so uh, how are uh, the components of our measure of economic well-being are basically um, to look at command over products, right? So we divide those into two categories, commodities and non-commodities. So by definition, commodities are products, goods and services produced for exchange. So you can think of those as marketable uh, commodities and then non-marketable commodities um, or non-marketed commodities. So we measure uh, command over commodities using income. So income from wealth and all other cash income, government non-cash transfers, and uh, labor non-cash transfers, and we subtract out taxes. Right? This is one thing that uh, the standard measure of household income doesn't do. Uh, so ours is an after-tax measure. Um, then uh, we also include public provisioning and self-provisioning of non-commodities, which obviously um, the uh, household income measure does not include. So I'll talk a bit more about specifically what those pieces are now. Um, so how we construct our measure is we take uh, the household income um, and take some things out. Uh, we take out property income um, and cash transfers. Okay, So we take out property income because we want to use a better um, uh, something that better captures the impact of uh, households' net worth on the economic well-being of the household. So property income, not all property generates income, but um, it's all, uh, you know, a potential source of command over, over commodities uh, in the present. So we want to capture that. Effect. So um, what we do, uh, instead of using uh, property income, we annuitize uh, net worth and debt. Uh, well, we annuitize assets and debt, right, uh, based on characteristics of the household. Um, then uh, we add in um, net government expenditures, which is transfers, which we took out in the first part. We added in back in. Uh, we also add public consumption, which is spending by the government on things like education, infrastructure, these things don't enter into household income measures generally, uh, but they, they uh, substantially impact households, especially when you think about education and public schools. Um, and finally, we add in the value of household production. Oh, as I said, we take out taxes. Right? So we add in the value of household production, and that gives us our uh, final um, measure, lean mu. Um, okay. So... Uh, uh, so, in the presentation, I'll be talking about estimates that we generated for the U.S. from 1959 to 2007. Uh, we haven't done 2010 yet, uh, although I think the last presentation will suggest uh, what we will find when we do <laughs> uh, for the U.S. Um, because the survey of consumer finances, which Ed used in his presentation, is the source of the wealth information in our measure. Um, so. We also have um, sets of estimates for um, Canada, Britain, and France, for two, di two different years for each country. Um, so a couple of things to note is that um, to make uh, the measure comparable over time in one country and uh, between countries uh, means that each uh, set of comparisons I make is going to actually represent a slightly different estimate. <laughs> because uh, especially in the between country comparisons, not all the com individual subcomponents of things like wealth especially are available in each country. So just uh, to highlight that. So if you notice things like the median wealth in the US, uh, median income from wealth in the US being different for the same year, that's why, because we're comparing it to different countries. Okay. so. Um, Moving along, uh, I have much more color in my presentation than the previous two speakers. I hope you'll take that into account when you're filling out your evaluations. Um, so uh, things to note, uh, the very top bars right, are the uh, average annual growth rate of real um, uh, household income, census income, and lean mu, uh, our measure. 
uh, between 1959 and 2007, so over almost 50 years. Uh, you can see that there, the average annual growth rate is not exactly rip-roaring. It's uh, 0.67 and 0.69 respectively. So not very fast compared to the growth of real GDP per capita over the period, which was 2.3%. So uh, that's one th important thing to notice. Uh, you can also see that there is considerable variance over years, uh, over periods, right? So if you, uh, the periods are delineated based on the years that we did estimates for. So there's some amount of uh, endpoint <laughs> bias involved uh, that shows through, especially uh, if you look at 1982 to 1989, it appears that the Reagan years were very, very good for U.S. households. Um, uh, you may have had a different impression. Um, but one thing to notice uh, in terms of comparing our measure with the household income measure is that in the 60s and 70s, uh, bulimia grows uh, more slowly or shrinks more quickly, as the case may be, than household income, whereas in the uh, 80s and 90s, uh, that flips. Right? Bulimia grows faster and household income grows slower. Uh, and then in the 2000s, uh, the aughts, um, it's kind of a mixed picture. Um, so uh, just to look at, and uh, some, of these, um, some of these tables and figures might start to look a little similar since Ed uh, has been so involved with our measure over time. Uh, we have some of the same tables, or at least same looking tables. Um, this, th this is the uh, contribution of different components of our measure to the overall growth rates in different periods um, and uh, uh, for the middle quintile. Um, so these are average, the average growth rate for the middle quintile in the U.S. for these periods. Um, you can see, uh, first of all, you can notice that um, the base income uh, is much more important for household income uh, than for the lean mu, right? By construction, there's just more in the lean mu than in uh, household income. Uh, and the, you know, the average amounts for LIMU are higher than for household income. Um, and uh, this especially is uh, noticeable. If you look at the, uh, the decomposition for the whole period, base income is 16.6%, the growth of LIMU, 23.4% of money income. <coughs> now, uh, but for the LIMU, the single largest contributor uh, for the period, for those 50 years, 48 years, uh, was transfers, right? Not, uh, not money income, right? Not base income. Base income, I should say, if it's not obvious, is basically wages for the most part. Um, so, uh, but transfers is a much more important uh, component in the growth of economic well-being for the middle quintile, right? So more important than for uh, than base income. So that's that's an important uh, point. Um, uh, for um, money income, you know the opposite is true, right? Money income, base income is a much more important component than for uh, than transfers. Um, now. Uh, this, this is especially true if you look at um, the period from 2000 to 2007, right, which uh, you may remember was not particularly great years for U.S. households, especially in the middle. Uh, but you can see that transfers, uh, you know, accounted for, uh, you know, all, just about all the growth <laughs> in household economic well-being. Um, net government expenditures for sure did. Uh, you can see that 2000 to 2004, the change uh, uh, was positive, right? So since those are taxes, uh, the change for taxes was positive. So the, bur the tax burden for middle quintile households decreased, right? This is the Bush tax cuts. Um, not so much for 2000 to 2004 to 2007. But, um, you know, the, the impact of uh, net government expenditures is, uh, for the two periods, is greater than the overall growth. So that's um, quite quite a stunning result. Um, just looking at the share of each quintile, um, this is a fairly familiar story. This is for Lemu uh, only. 
um, and these are lemia quintiles. Um, and you can see that uh, the top, right, is the, the top quintile has been growing and it has the lion's share, almost 50% of the aggregate lemur total. Uh, whereas um, that has grown, um, everybody else has decreased except for the bottom 20%, which has increased slightly uh, in the first few periods, right? Uh, it increased up all the way up to 6.4% of the total for the bottom 20% of households uh, by 18, 1982, but is actually lower now than it was in 1959. Okay, so there's a lot of uh, USA boosterism in my, uh, in my presentation, you'll see. Um, okay. Now, uh, these are some of the same numbers, just kind of presented a little differently. And you can, the, the thing to note here, right, is the, uh, the, the uh, lightest gray line here is the top 5%. And you can see it pull away from the middle 20%. So uh, up until 1989, right, the share of the top 5% in total LEMU was about the same as the middle 20% share, right? But after that, there was a divergence. So the, stopped being quite the same. So you can see that has the impact on the top 20%, right? That increase in the top 20% is almost all in the top 5%. Um, okay, if you look at the Gini coefficients uh, for uh, LEMU and uh, household income for each year, um, you can see the Gini is higher for money income, for household income, right? And this is due to a couple things. Uh, first, that uh, taxes are taken out of LEMU, and taxes are still somewhat progressive in terms of uh, distribution in the U.S. And also, uh, household production, which is a pretty large component of LEMU, about 25%, uh, is much more equally distributed than things like income from wealth and even, house, and even uh, wage and salary income. So um, you can see that there's a fairly uh, common about four-point difference but you can see that both measures have increased quite a bit. Um, now, the change in uh, uh, inequality, though, is not due to base money income, right? So it's not due to uh, wages and salaries. Uh, if you compare 1959 and 2007, right, the contribution of base money income to uh, LEMU inequality is pretty much the same. In fact, it goes down a little, right? Um, so the, the big story, uh, which may not be a surprise to many of you, especially not to Ed, since he just talked about wealth, is uh, the contribution of income from wealth, and especially um, income from non-home wealth, right? Imputed rent is uh, basically the contribution of uh, home ownership, right? The rest is uh, mostly stocks, bonds, those other uh, financial and non-financial assets. And their uh, they're the biggest contributor and they've grown the most, right? So an additional almost 10 Gini points just due to income from wealth between 1959 and 2007. Right? And if you just look at 2000, the story is the same. So uh, now that based on Ed's, uh, Ed's um, presentation, we'd expect that, to, that contribution to shrink a little in 2010, but uh, hardly to go away entirely, right? Okay. Um, now, the, the, what offsets to some degree uh, the, the increased contribution from wealth to overall uh, LEMU inequality is the uh, increased impacts of uh, transfers and public consumption, right? And the uh, slightly more progressive <laughs> character, uh, actually, no, that's, yeah, more progressive character of the tax system in 2007 than 1959, right? So those ameliorate the uh, increase in inequality due to the inequality, of, the increasing inequality of wealth ownership. Okay. So um, let's move on to uh, some international comparisons now. Um, first of all, looking at uh, the uh, U.S. Uh, oh, I, I said right, this was going to be a U.S booster kind of uh, presentation, and USA is number one. Um, 
uh, at least higher in Limu and per capita GDP uh, in, uh, than Britain, Canada, and the US. Um, and the, the, um, the lead in each of these has grown over time, over the periods. So uh, just to talk quickly about the periods, so the comparison between the US and Britain is mid-90s and mid-2000s, right? So 2005 uh, for Britain and 2004 for the US, 1995 for both US and Britain. Um, 2000 and 2004 and 2005 for US and the Canada specifically, and then 1989 and 2000 for both US and France. Um, so you can see that um, the, uh, in terms of um, uh, Limeo and per capita GDP, right, the gap is larger uh, in all cases for per capita GDP. Uh, but there's been striking convergence in um, Limeo between the US and Britain, for example. Right? Uh, not so much for France, um, but, uh, but somewhat for Canada, right? although nowhere near as much for, as for Britain. Right? So Britain, uh, it appears, is almost entirely caught up. Um, now, um, and here, here we can start to see why. Uh, if we look at um, gaps between the US and uh, Britain, uh, at different points along the distribution. So these, uh, the, um, what we're looking at are quintiles of, uh, ah, I'm sorry, deciles of Limu, right? So the top thick line is the first period, the mid-1990s, so 1995 uh, in the right here. So this is the percent gap between the US and Britain. And you can see that for almost the entire distribution, it's gone down quite a lot. It's actually gone down quite a lot uh, at the, even at the 10th decile. But you can see that um, the bottom three deciles in Britain are actually now higher than uh, the US by the mid-2000s. Right? Um, and you can see that uh, why. The top line in the annual percentage change in Britain is, uh, is Britain, right? So 1995 to 2005, uh, there was actually um, um, inequality reducing growth in Limu in Britain, right? So the bottom de uh, deciles grew faster than the top. Right? Whereas in, in the US, right, you have this more normal, uh, normal <laughs> uh, growth pattern in um, well-being, something like uh, what Branko was showing earlier. Right? So you have the higher deciles growing faster than the lower deciles. So inequality increasing growth. Okay. Oops, that's not what I meant to do. Um, okay, so looking at Canada, you can see that uh, as, as the first graph in the international comparisons indicated, the convergence was not as great. So you can see that the, uh, the shift, right, the gap decreased, but nowhere near as much in Canada, between Canada and the US um, uh, over the period. It's also a much shorter period, only about four or five years for this rather than 10. Um, and also, uh, you know, there's a specific endpoint that we're talking about here for the U.S., right, 2000. There's a big uh, tech bubble that bursts, so that has an impact. <coughs> and you can see the impact <laughs> in the, um, the annual percentage change by decile of Limu, right? There's actually a big drop off at the top, and that is the loss of financial wealth and the financial meltdown in 2000, uh, late 2000, 2001 in the US. Not so much in Canada, right? Uh, Canada didn't seem to have that uh, impact. Um, and for France, you can see that the, uh, the gaps haven't changed for most, almost all of the distribution except the very bottom and the very top, right? Um, 2000, uh, it's the black line on top. It's actually gotten uh, worse at the top a little better at the bottom, um, the gaps. And um, you can see why. Uh, for France, the bottom grew much more quickly than the US, and the top grew much more quickly in the US uh, than France over the period. So this is over the 90s now, 
this is the end point is 2000. Right? So the peak of the, uh, the bubble in the US. Okay, so um, looking again at the middle quintile, so the middle class, um, uh, a lot of numbers here. Um, so, I, and I'll go back to this later if anybody would like to uh, dig into these a little more. So I'll just give you some highlights. Um, remember, there's a huge convergence, and this is true in the middle class, certainly. Uh, in Britain, the convergence mostly has to do with the increase in income from wealth. So uh, the second line uh, here, you can see um, the gap is positive, right? And uh, in the mid-2000s, uh, Britain has almost completely caught up. The last column, right, is the ratio of U.S. to Britain uh, in the mid-90s and mid-2000s. And you can see uh, income from wealth in the U.S. was almost twice as high as in Britain, whereas in the mid-2000s, it's basically the same, right? 3% difference. So that's the big story there, um, which, you know, uh, it's um, in terms of the overall impact, you can see that um, the uh, income from wealth in the U.S. has actually shrunk by quite a bit between, uh, between the mid-90s and mid-2000s due to the crash in the U.S. Right? It had an impact even on the middle quintile. Uh, looking at, um, oh, one more thing about uh, Britain. Uh, the, other, the other big story here is uh, transfers, right? Uh, the big increase in transfers in Britain so that the US has fallen farther behind in terms of the contribution of uh, transfers to economic well-being um, and um, public consumption as well, right? So there was some catch up there. <coughs> okay, moving to Canada. Um, Moving to Canada, that's right. So uh, basically, uh, base income actually falls in the US in the early 2000s, which is not, not a surprise. Uh, but it doesn't in Canada, it actually rises um, so that there's some convergence there. And that's most of the convergence. Uh, it offsets um, some of the, the, um, the loss, the relative loss Canada has in transfers this is due to the increase in transfers in the U.S. due to Medicare Part D, right? the, the um, prescription drug benefit that was added uh, in the first Bush administration. Um, moving to France, um, there's, for France, there are uh, gains in uh, income from wealth that exceed the gains in the U.S. Right? This is from 1989 to 2000, so that's kind of remarkable, right? Uh, it is the middle in income quintile, but you know when you think of gains in wealth, uh, you think U.S. should might have a big advantage there, but not so much according to our numbers. Um, you can see that net government expenditures uh, is basically a wash. Uh, U.S. is 56% of France's in uh, 1989, 55%, so not much change, right? And there's not much change in the actual numbers either. Uh, so that's interesting. Um, but you can see that transfers uh, increased a bit, but so did taxes. So, um, But certainly the level, overall level of transfers is much higher in France, um, but it doesn't, it doesn't, hasn't added to the, uh, um, any kind of in, uh, convergence between the two countries. Uh, so the comparison is different, but in terms of the overall importance of transfers in French uh, economic well-being, obviously much higher than in the U.S., right? Uh, $30,000 uh, base income, 21,000 transfers in France, as opposed to 56,000 uh, base income in the U.S. in 2000, compared to 12,000 in transfers. So clearly the composition of economic well-being in uh, France is much different. Okay. Oh. Wow. Four and one. So, um, so the U.S. leads in inequality still. That's great. Uh, and the, the lead um, is growing <laughs> against Britain. Woohoo! Uh, and you can see you can see why. Right earlier, we saw that that uh, growth over this period in Great in Britain was inequality reducing. 
uh, whereas not so in the U.S. So naturally the gap in Gini coefficients is going to have increased over that period. Um, now, uh, and, but uh, un unfortunately Canada has sort of caught up uh, uh, by the mid-2000s to U.S. and mostly this is due to a uh, decrease in, a slight decrease in uh, inequality in the U.S. due to the, to the recession. Um, and then uh, for France, the gap has increased quite a bit more. Um, okay. Um, now, for, for Britain, right, the story basically is that um, income from wealth is much less unequally distributed in Britain than in the U.S., and that counts for the gap. Um, and this is for 2005. Canada, same story, right? Uh, the income from wealth is much less unequally distributed than in um, than in the U.S., but uh, basic base income is also notably less unequally distributed than in the U.S., right? not as much so for Britain. Uh, while France, uh, base income is much less unequally distributed. Right? It's lower, but it's definitely un less unequally distributed as well, uh, even less so than uh, income from wealth. Right? So that's unusual, to say the least. And in France, net government expenditures are not uh, inequality reducing in 2000. So that's a little bit of a, uh, you know, goes against the kind of received wisdom. But uh, in the U.S. they are. Um, okay. Now, uh, kind of uh, to sum up, in the U.S., median economic well-being grew uh, very sluggishly over the last half century. Uh, in the 2000s, only an increase in transfers maintained economic well-being for the middle class at all. Uh, that made up for the drop in income uh, from uh, wages and salaries and from wealth. Um, and inequality increased, driven by uh, the increase in um, the ownership of non-home wealth, especially at the top. Right? Uh, and by 2010, this will have decreased a bit, but still um, very notable. Um, fine. And uh, in comparison with other countries, uh, median economic well-being has uh, converged in Brit most in Britain due to transfers. Uh, in Canada, not as much, but that was due to base income. And in France, hardly at all. Um, inequality is considerably higher in the US, uh, but the gap increased for Britain and France and decreased for Canada. Um, and policy, um, I, th I think especially in the context of the current budget debate, you know, it, it's important to stress the importance of transfers uh, for uh, middle-income households, um, you know, not just for the poor, but for, uh, you know, quite far up the uh, income scale. Uh, things like Social Security for elderly people are vital, right? Um, and uh, the importance of public consumption, especially on things like education, is hard to overstate. So, and that's it. Talking to who are you addressing to? Oh, I'm addressing it to the people in the conference generally. I'm addressing it to the speakers. And you've given us all these measures, but you really haven't addressed the issue of what the social and political implications might be. And so I'd like the, the panelists to comment on that. Uh, well, I mean, you know. I guess you have to believe inequality is bad. <laughs> That's sort of the social implication of inequality rises. That's a social bad. Uh, you know, I, I think uh, you know, I've uh, <laughs> spoken to at least 100 reporters over the last uh, 20 years. And they always say, well, you know, what's the problem with inequality? And I always say, well, you know, you have to believe that inequality is bad, that we want to. 
then of course you can uh, you can talk about some of the implications of inequality. Uh, uh, for example, uh, it may have led to the financial crisis. It may have uh, it may mean uh, shorter life expectancies for uh, the poor. You know, the gap in life expectancies between the rich and poor in the United States has, has risen dramatically. Uh, may mean uh, a big gap in, uh, at least in the U.S., in uh, educational attainment. I mean, you know, these are all implications of, of having a rising or high level of inequality, but I think, at least from my point of view, by and large, you know, uh, you have to believe that inequality is a bad thing. So I don't know what more to say. Except um, no, nothing else I could agree with what that said. Well, I'll, I'll add that it also has uh, pretty strong political implications, especially in the U.S. I'd say the increase in it, uh, the inequality and in the distribution of wealth has had uh, profound implications on the political process and what uh, what the uh, you know the the boundaries of political debates can be and uh, whose interests are represented uh, in the political process. You know, uh, and these. These are not developments that have been to, for the good of uh, the people in general and uh, certainly won't be, will have very uh, profound and um, unhappy impacts going decades into the future, especially given the neglect of things like climate change. Well, of course, Minsky would have had a different response. He would have said that this is a time that the government has to be big and not small that uh, somehow or other in Washington we seem to think that that would be the economic model for the government. Any other questions? Yes. Thank you. I remembered that um, late into the Reagan administration, uh, George Bush started doing a free trade agreement with Canada and then we began aggressive free trade after German reunification. So. Um, what would your comment be, or what, what do you think about the policy change of our using non-tariffed importation, which they give a nice expression called free trade, and the um, impact on the, you know, the increasing wealth uh, on fairness, the distribution of, of wealth, so to speak, became much more contrasted in this period, post-German reunification, um, um, you know, things like the G20 agreements, the U.S. shrinking our, deindustrializing our economy and using free trade as, as the, uh, a mechanism to achieve that. And the impact that, I mean, oh, has there been an attempt in the models to, you know, look at different independent variables and see what's been the biggest, um, that which by, whereby uh, wealth distribution would have been most affected? And, and look at it over a time series. And it would, tra you know, the use of, um, or b eliminating tariffs against Canada. So ca Canada was a benefactor of having had a free trade agreement with the United States. England didn't do the deindustrialization and the free trade that the United States did. Southern hemisphere countries were benefited by free trade because we went into free trade agreements. So this covers all of your um, um, talks and what are your thoughts? I'd say, first of all, I'd, I'd talk to Canadian auto workers before I said that they benefited from free trade with the U.S. <laughs> um, uh, I think free trade agreements were just kind of uh, one of the final nails in the coffin uh, of, you know, a kind of uh, an expectation of a better life for uh, most Americans than their parents had. You know, that, you know, that, uh, you know, was one part of a set of policies uh, that have, you know, affected this transfer of wealth upwards, you know, and that includes busting unions, it includes free trade, it includes shrinking the public sector, it includes a lot of things like that. Any one of you want to add? Yes. Siren Kashik from uh, Pace University. Uh, one question from e for each person. Uh, the first one is, uh, if we look at only last five years, uh, does the global uh, uh, inequality, how does that compare, compared with the longer period you have analyzed? 
uh, that the global inequality, uh, because you didn't look at the last five years, or since the, this great recession, in other words, um, does it make a difference to your results? Uh, on the uh, second paper, uh, if you look at uh, the slice of 5% top uh, income people, uh, then does your result become more consistent between uh, wealth inequality and income to reconcile the differences that you found in terms of income and wealth? Uh, that is for Wolf. Uh, if you just look at the top 5% uh, uh, of the richest people or, or income earners instead of the top uh, uh, 20%. Uh, and the third paper, uh, the question is, uh, is U.S. converging with Europe? Uh, is uh, U.S. converging with, the, with the Canada uh, and so on? And a general question for everyone, uh, what are the implications of all your presentations uh, for reforming the U.S. financial system, U.S. banking system? Uh, and so on. So, so there are four questions for you. Thank you. Well, I'll start with the global inequality. Uh, I don't have numbers, actually. It may seem strange to you, but you know, in order to get that dot, behind that dot are 10 million individual income, on average, between eight and 10. Uh, in, in order to produce a dot, you need to have household service for 120 countries. Uh, from 2012, I think I might have it in 2015. So I don't have a number. That's the part of the answer. But what do I think has happened? I actually believe that that, that dot has gone down further. And it has gone down because of high, relatively high, or continued high growth rates of India and China. Actually, you know, to, to simplify the matter, you basically can see, you think of global inequality like three components. Are Poor and rich countries converging or diverging, and they have been converging since 2000. Uh, is inequality in individual, in individual countries going up? And that's generally been either stable or going up, so that's a negative element. And what's happening to the mean income or growth of China and India compared to the United States? And that, of course, has been, the, the gap has been diminished. So basically, you know, I would, of oh, the three elements, two are actually in favor of reducing global inequality and one is kind of neutral to negative. So I would say that probably the dot went down, and I think it is, as I mentioned before, it's actually, I think it's an uh, historical event. It's not like a small event. Uh, and it has many geopolitical, economic, or whatever you want to, to, to make it, implications. Now, if I may only on the, the relationship, I mean, obviously Ed is going to answer the second question, but I just want to put in something about Slight difference in our results about the U.S., not about the other countries, but the U.S. in my graph really shows the same pattern as the other three countries. And I think it's partly, and actually the uh, sizes data for 2011 or 2012 even, show exactly the same pattern as what I showed here. And I think the reason, there are two reasons. The first one is our definitions are different. I will not go into now fight of the definitions, but I have a pretty standard disposable income definition. And the second one is that I actually think, and then Ed will correct me, correct me on that, I think that there was a decline in inequality between 2007 and 2009 approximately. But then there was a reversal. Yeah. And that reversal I think is going on now. So we may be catching slightly different periods. Yeah, yeah, I, I, actually I agree with you, yes, yes. The, uh, at least based on particularly in SAIS on the tax data, though not on the, on the CPS data, yeah, there was a, a, a pretty sharp decline of income inequality between 2007 and 2009, and then it started to reverse, and probably uh, going forward, it's probably back up to where it was in 2007, maybe even above. Uh, so, I, you know, if, if you look at... Uh, What's happened to wealth inequality, if we try to project that forward, I suspect it's, it's continuing to increase. Why is that? Well, because stock prices have recovered a lot more than housing prices. So remember, that was one of my variables, the ratio of stock prices to housing prices. Uh, so the stock market is back to where it was in 2007, at least in nominal terms. Uh, housing prices have gone up 7% maybe since 2000. Uh, and 2010, 
So they're still below where they were in 2007. So that ratio is now has gone up uh, relative to 2010. So I suspect that uh, there will be uh, you know, a, a continued increase in wealth inequality. And you know, as we were just saying, if income inequality has also gone up since 2010, that will further exacerbate the increase of wealth inequality. So uh, I think once we get to 2013 survey, we'll see uh, an, an additional spike in wealth inequality. That's what I would suspect. Uh, by the way, my, you know, the figures, you, you asked why didn't you use the top 5% instead of the top 20%, that they show exactly the same pattern. Rise of wealth inequality and at least uh, for this period, 2007 to 2010, a decline in income inequality. So. Tom, do you have a so the question was, are the U.S. and Europe converging? I, I guess my, my first thought was to say, uh, you know, the only honest answer an economist can ever give to a question is it depends, you know. It depends on what you mean by converging, you know. In some ways, they're converging, right? I think the, the, uh, the you know, the middle and lower income people in the U.S. are kind of stuck. And so eventually, the middle and lower income people in the uh, in Britain and France and uh, Canada will catch up, right, in some ways. Uh, I don't know about the top, though. I don't know if, I don't know to what extent, uh, you know, the wealthy in Britain and Germany and France are catching up to the wealthy in the U.S. Uh, financial reform? Yeah, well, I was, I was arguing uh, in favor of, uh, uh, you know, more restrictive uh, policies on uh, mortgages just in order to uh, prevent another financial crisis. Uh, yeah, in terms of uh, reducing wealth inequality, uh, I, you know, I think, uh, uh, I think you have to move to uh, taxes and uh, obviously. <laughs> Obviously, the more. I mean, the thing about you know rising income inequality, why that leads to rising wealth inequality. It's not. It's not only because the rich have more income, but they also save a higher percentage of that income relative to the middle class. So, uh, their addition to their wealth is uh, magnified when their share of income goes up. Uh, so, you know, I think the only way to reverse this, oh, well, not the only way, but certainly one way is to <laughs> raise taxes on the, on the rich so uh, they, they can't uh, accumulate uh, uh, as big a share of their income in terms of additional wealth. Um, I mean, my, my gut says yes. I mean, the, this is sort of beyond my, my area of expertise. I'm not really a financial economist. Uh, but, uh, you know, I do suspect that if, uh, if more credit, uh, more credit on a uh, reasonable basis was made available to middle class and poorer people, it would give them more opportunity to accumulate assets, and that would tend to reduce wealth inequality. That would be uh, my gut feeling. So. Yeah, the one thought I had okay. was to regulate uh, commodities markets, uh, commo derivatives on commodities, specifically on oil and food. That would go a long way, I think. Yeah. Khaled Mathabdin from the College of St. Rose. 
Actually, I have uh, three mini questions for all of you. Branko, you said that India and China played a major role in uplifting the standard of living of all the countries. But how come you didn't mention about South Africa, Russia, and Brazil? They were equally involved in uplifting the standards of living of uh, other nations. And my second question is to Edward. And that is, uh, Edward, have you done any income and wealth trends lately and analysis of these? And you mentioned that serious regulations are needed for the financial sector. I was here about five, six weeks back to attend the Federal Reserve meeting. And in fact, what I found out, or what I could infer from their meeting was they still, up to this point, don't know what is going on actually so far as the whole financial picture is concerned. So would you mind elaborating on that? And Ajay, to you, my question is that you mentioned between 82 to 89 period during Reagan years, uh, uh, well-being of the country was uplifted tremendously. Was it due to tax cut or was it due to the spending which was done by Reagan. Uh, keep in mind that what Reagan was uh, spending in one year, when you look at the history of the United States, uh, in 166 years, whatever was spent by the US government under Reagan, that amount was being spent in one year. So was it due to tax cut or spending programs? Thank you. Uh, well, okay, on the first one, um, I, let me be clear. Um, China and India played crucial role in reduction in global inequality for two reasons, and it's actually by order of magnitude compared to other countries. First, because they are relatively poor countries, and when you are poor and you have lots of people, that's the second reason. I mean, China 1.3 billion, India 1.2 billion, and these people become richer then you really sort of income distribution becomes less skewed because you basically move people who were poor at the very bottom of the income distribution. I'm not talking about poverty only now, but I'm talking about inequality. You move them towards the middle. So essentially the distribution gets a little bit less unequal. And because of their size and because of the growth rates, and, and that happens despite the fact that within India and China there was an increase in inequality. Uh, they, of course, had much more of an impact than uh, the other three countries that you mentioned because if you look, for example, population size, obviously, it's like huge difference. You know, Russia is 150 million, you know, uh, Brazil is 220, I believe, and South Africa is like, what are 30, I mean, 60 billion, 60 million. So it's really big difference. And then secondly, of course, uh, they were actually, first, Russia actually did not even have growth over 20 years practically. And then um, uh, Brazil also had mediocre growth over the longer term period. So really the contribution of China and India is just out of, um, how should I say, it's not even in the same ballpark when you do the you know, Gini calculation than the other three countries. Yeah, again, I, I'm uh, uh, probably a little bit out of my depth talking about financial markets, but I think when you have a, uh, you know, a Minsky type asset bubble occurring as you did from uh, 2000, even earlier to 2007, and you have the uh, financial institutions exacerbating this trend by providing easy credit and uh, oystering, uh, particularly mortgage loans on uh, people who couldn't possibly repay them. Uh, you know, I think you're just, just asking for trouble. And just, uh, it's just going to, going to be a slight bursting of the asset bubble that will, uh, you know, cause the whole system to go under as, as, uh, as what happened. Right? And, uh, you know, I think you need regulations, as I believe exist in most other countries, uh, to prevent the recurrence of this. And, uh, you know, I think there have to be... Uh, federally mandated loan standards imposed on banks so that they can't issue uh, these, uh, these non-credit worthy loans. Uh, do you think banks would have an incentive to 
to do that themselves, to, uh, not to issue loans that are, have a high probability of failing. But securitization uh, allows them to do this without, as I said, uh, holding on to any liability. Uh, of course, why would people buy these uh, securitized <laughs> assets? Well, uh, then you have the rating agencies in collusion with the, <laughs> with the, uh, 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 with the, uh, with the mor mortgage loaners. And so, you know, you have a, a system that's obviously uh, exacerbating itself into uh, a high probability of a financial crisis. Uh, so, you know, the government imposed regulations as they, as they had before uh, the big de deregulation uh, occurred in, during the Clinton administration. I think a lot of the uh, financial crisis would have been avoided. And, uh, you know, in, in terms of my numbers, you know, you wouldn't have seen this uh, drastic decline in net worth. And you wouldn't have seen uh, this you know, this protracted period of unemployment, you won't have seen incomes going down. I mean, you know, the, the point is that, you know, the, the, the majority of people in this country really lost out because of this financial crisis. I think that, that message is sometimes lost. It's, uh, you know, people focus too much on the macro side and say, well, you know, we, we managed to keep the system going, but uh, I would, I would say uh, the majority, maybe even the vast majority, really lost out over the last uh, six, seven years. And uh, certainly in terms of wealth, I think it may be another uh, decade or two before they recover their, their lost wealth. And uh, so, you know, that's sort of my motivation for this. And uh, my point of making that comparison was uh, that the endpoints that you pick matter. Uh, so our beginning point for the 80s was 1982, which is the you know, bottom of the recession. So you know, if you compare the bottom of the recession to 1989, right, the, the next peak, basically, um, you know, it's going to look really good. That, that was just the point I was making there. And certainly uh, you know, Reagan's in spending was uh, instrumental in uh, raising the, the U.S. economy out of recession. You know, he had to do something after the the Fulker went crazy and drove up interest rates to double digits, right? So, um, uh, yeah, I mean, certainly that had an impact. I don't know. I'm not sure to what extent. I haven't seen comparisons of the spending and tax cuts, you know, to what extent, you know, the relative contribution to growth in the 80s was there. But, but the point I was making was that, you know, because I'm using 1982 as one of the years, because that's when we have wealth data, you know, the 80s look a lot better than I think they really were. Right. That's all I was saying. Is there another question? You spoke most uh, clearly, I think, about the tremendous uh, uh, drop in wealth uh, created both by the first by the financial crisis and and also by the drop in um, home prices. And I'm just wondering whether, well, let me just ask you two questions. Do you have any thoughts about the sort of the lasting, whether there is a lasting impact on consumers, middle class consumers and middle class uh, investors? Uh, in, in terms of you know the ramifications of that psychologically and, and such an abrupt change in wealth and whether you know we have a generation of sadder but wiser uh, investors and consumers and what the impact is on the economy from that what it could be and then I noticed that you have written a lot about social security and pensions so um, maybe you could talk a little bit about um, the proposal to uh, just to be very specific, change the uh, the measure of uh, the CPI, the way Social Security uh, will um, compensate for inflation. Uh, yeah, uh, so I can remember the questions. <laughs> um, first question. 
Uh, what was the first question? I'm sorry. Oh, right, right. Yeah, yeah. No, I think, um, well, I think, I think a couple of things have already happened. Um, first of all, I didn't, I didn't emphasize this, but uh, there actually has been a uh, significant retrenchment of debt among the middle class, uh, even from 2007 to 2010. Uh, not just mortgage debt, but uh, consumer debt. I mean, a, a big decline in their outstanding balances. Uh, the other thing that's happened uh, is uh, a fairly substantial decline in stock ownership uh, over these years. So, you know, I think, I think the likely implication is that uh, the middle class uh, is, is not going to go into the kind of uh, debt spree it did uh, leading up to uh, the Great Recession. Um, now, of course, this is uh, partly due to the fact that, that banks have really tightened up on credit, so it's not, it's not just that uh, uh, middle class consumers uh, may not want to take on more debt. Maybe they can't, so it's a combination of the two. But I don't think, I think you know, my, my sense is that uh, American consumers are going to be much more cautious. I think a lot of them have, were really burnt uh, by the Great Recession. I don't think you're going to see uh, the same kind of expansion of uh, consumption. Uh, you know, so the implication is that uh, the expansionary effect that you had uh, from 2001 to 2007, even during the 90s, uh, from, from uh, household consumption is just not going to be there, or at least not be there as much as it was before. So what's going to pick up the slack? Well, that's, you know, <laughs> that's where the government has to come in. And, uh, you know, in, in order to, I think, to, to get the economy rolling again, uh, you're not going to be able, you're not going to be able to rely on household consumption. Uh, or exports, business investment, of course, is still uh, uh, pretty low. Uh, and so you're really going to have to get the stimulus kick from uh, federal spending. That, that's, uh, I think that's the bottom line. Um, you know, with regard to Social Security, that's, you know, that's another factor that uh, I think is going to depress uh, consumer spending. I mean, the fact that you have those lost years, you know, they talk about Japan's lost decade of the 1990s. I think you're going to find a lost decade. Uh, uh, it's not going to be, uh, uh, but, you know, from like 19, uh, 2007 maybe up to 2015, this is going to be a really a lost decade uh, for the American middle class. Uh, part of one implication, you saw uh, incomes going down. I mean, wages have gone down. And, uh, and of course, you've had uh, this high unemployment. So it means that, uh, that this buildup of Social Security has, has taken a real hit over this period as well. So right now, uh, when you know, uh, this group of workers uh, reaches retirement age, they will have lost a considerable amount of Social Security accumulation. So as it stands now, when they retire, they will get uh, substantially, maybe not substantially, but certainly uh, uh, significantly lower Social Security benefits than they would have gotten if we hadn't gone through the Great Recession. So they're already going to experience this, uh, this hit. And to further exacerbate it by by lowering the uh, cost of living adjustment, I think is uh, is cruel and unusual punishment. I mean, you know, they're <laughs> they're already going to uh, retire with with lower benefits than they originally expected, and that, by the way, is also going to affect their consumption because they're not going to uh, consume as much as well. Thank you very very much. Thank you. Thank you.